Welcome everybody to this Vatacuti Foundation webinar series program on in-person versus virtual healthcare. With us, we have several panelists. We also have Raj Vatacuti, the president and founder of the Vatacuti Foundation, and Dr. Mahendra Bandari, who's going to be serving as our moderator today. He is the CEO of the Vatacuti Foundation. The Vatacuti Foundation has been in existence well over 20 years. It was founded by Raj Vedakuti and his wife Padma to give back to society in, in many different ways. And one of the main focuses is on healthcare. And they're one of the leading supporters of not only medical technology, but also virtual healthcare. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Mahendra Bandari, who is our moderator. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking your time out. Let me tell you about Vedakuti Foundation is involved and with one single objective of how to improve patient outcomes. We have leveraged technology. We have leveraged surgeon education so far. Now we have, we are committed to patient outcome and we are recently getting our focus directed towards empowering patients with technology and monitor their health at home in wellness and in disease. Uh, we are grateful to our chairman. He is here today. Usually it's difficult to find time for him, but since the subject is close to his heart, it would be very pertinent. I'll request Raj to say a few words of his perception about the whole issue of empowering patients for wellness and home health monitoring. And then I'll open up the panel. Thank you, Dr. Bandari. I'll just take one minute. Uh, <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I feel always, unless the patient uh, takes the control of the health, it's very hard to solve the healthcare issues today. Healthcare system is so complex and so difficult to really getting the, the very effective outcomes, including the drug formulation, a lot of the uh, issues. The unable to, till today, not able to really get a very effective data uh, analysis of the behaviors of the patients based on their conditions and the drugs they take. And that's why this remote management is to monitor, not uh, when they're sick only on a regular basis, so that will help to really see how each patient is reacting to get a more better uh, formulation of the effect and how we can help them to the, with the more data-based and uh, including the uh, long time with the real-time real data. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all those things can help to provide the automated actions so that the patients can take care of themselves. Healthcare costs are skyrocketing everywhere in the world and they're still people not able to get timely help for the patients. The only way the, uh, we feel that the, it can be solved by patients taking the control in terms of on their own health and then ability to take care of them and then whenever, of course, the experts are always needed to help them out. But I think this, this will really change the whole healthcare paradigm. Uh, COVID-19 has changed that uh, very much. More and more we're seeing patients are converging to this and they see how important this is for them. And then hopefully with this, I think this whole paradigm will change, will bring out much effective way and change the healthcare. It's not about the uh, money you spend, it's about the the overall culture of patients take care of their health is the key importance. So those, we truly believe in it and we're focusing on see how we can be part of this uh, uh, new uh, paradigm of the healthcare. Thanks for participating today. Um, also, especially the panelists, thanks for taking your time and uh, giving your expertise in this area. And uh, hopefully this will be a very useful session for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh before we opened up, uh, Dr. Ganju asked me a question that what is your perception? I think it's very important to share my perception with the audience. There are two areas which always makes me suspicious of the future. One of them is artificial intelligence, which Raj uh, mentioned. In my lifetime, I have seen the fourth resurgence of artificial intelligence. And similarly, telemedicine, is one of those. Uh, trigger is now there because of the COVID. It was a crisis management. It was the need of the hour globally. 
And in US, despite technology and the patient culture, which is very educated, we telemedicine never picked up. Harvard data shows that from 1% to 81% teleconsults have gone up. This was pretty before. Now, the question everybody is asking, what is the durable element in it? What's going to happen after COVID crisis is over? Indicators are here. If you have to look into particularly United States and globally, why it picked up because the insurance companies were liberal, Medicare was liberal. They match the consultation in person with the virtual consultation. People couldn't have gone out in the crisis and they opened up relaxation. They relaxed the HIPAA regulations and confidentiality of the platforms. They relaxed what you call, initially it was only MD could consult, the rules were very strict, but then they opened up for ancillary services like uh, physiotherapy and psychiatry consultations and all. So the take is that about 70 to 80% of it is going to stay. The other question, number one, there are three objectives of this panel, which I told Dr. Ganju and I'm telling all of you, particularly the speakers. One is that what is in their crystal ball going to happen after COVID crisis is over. Number two is there are three areas of telemedicine. It could be wellness monitoring program with the gadgets easily available. Number two is what you call the critical care, monitoring of critical care patients. And I'm sure Sanvi will join. She has a very vast experience and published data on improving patient outcomes and bringing down the cost. And the third area, which is there is in the disease state. Now, my take on it is that it is technology was always there and technology has improved into miniaturization and you can have a consult while walking and whatever it is. Doctors and hospitals will accept it as long as the compensation don't go down. But I'm very worried about the last mile, whether the patient would accept it or not. Because even today, according to my experience, the weekend is the patient end because doctors consult and opinion would be as good as the information we can help patient to transmit in real time to the doctor. So with this, I will introduce my panel and get started with it. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ganju, who has a very rich experience and he's CEO of South Health, who works in primary care segment. And he's going to talk about, and he has a rich experience of pharmaceutical. What I liked about his business model in the previous one company, which he had when I interacted with him, that he has a revenue model, which is very interesting uh, about the primary care. And we'll hear from him. Dr. Jaya is my four decade friend. We both started our career at uh, Pondicherry. Uh, way back in 1980s, and he had joined IES and just completed his probation and took his first assignment as union um, um, uh, union territory cadre. He is an AIMS graduate, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, he's a doctor turned bureaucrat, and then went into what you call um, intellectual property. At Geneva for 24 years, and now he's back in telemedicine, and he has a very he's deeply involved, and he has two companies there, and he's CMP, not CEO of uh, Aims to Health. Uh, we have Prati Golcha, who is uh, uh, the head of the strategic initiative and works in South Africa and other countries uh, outside United States. And uh, that the Tricog is a very interesting company and he has an experience of Medi-Council. And I brought him because he had collected data through webinars of large number of patients sending surveys. So he'll be able to give us perspective on what is the current status of acceptance of telemedicine. Tanvi, I'm sure she would have joined or she'll join soon. 
uh, has runs uh, very very um, um, uh, vital uh, startup Vita Health, and she has an experience. And as I told you, she published uh, uh, data from her company, which has very clearly shown in cardiology and children care uh, that uh, it does improve patient outcome. Physician acceptability is long. Her model works through the clinics and physicians. And uh, so we will see how her experience could be translated into Indian scenario. With this, I will get started with Dr. Ganju. Back to you, Dr. Ganju. Thank you very much, Dr. Bhandari, for setting up the, the conversation. I'm very excited to be part of this discussion. My wife, co-founders at South Health and our mission is to is to build healthier communities. Uh, what I do is spend about 10 minutes talking through what we do at South Health. But I think before we talk about what we do, it's important to talk a little bit about why we do what we do. Um, just a quick background, Dr. Bhandari spoke about this. So I, I started my career after my medical graduation working for the pharmaceutical and then for the last 10 years, uh, I spent working at the intersection of health technology and consumer-focused communication. So going back to 2009, we were building digital platforms for uh, rural patients, uh, HIV AIDS patients out of Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Then done a ton of work with maternal health, building digital platforms for them. And this is when we were not using data, but we were using voice-based voice, voice -based solutions. And so over the last 10 or 12 years, I have seen the evolution of expectations of health consumers. And this is across different segments in India. I'm talking about rural segments as well as obviously the urban affluent users. And what I've seen is what really convinced us that there is a need to start looking at patients as a primary driver of the healthcare supply chain and, and, and start to reimagine the healthcare process. So very quickly, the context in which we work, there, there are two lenses we, uh, we use to, to frame the problem that we are trying to solve. The first is that healthcare is there at a critical inflection point, and I'm not referring to COVID. COVID has exacerbated a lot of underlying challenges with healthcare, but there has been huge disease burden, and we do a lot of work in chronic diseases, and there is a huge amount of challenges, especially in low and middle income countries that are grappling with the uh, challenge of infectious diseases and chronic diseases. Uh, the burden of chronic diseases is going up significantly. It's gone up significantly from 2008, where it was responsible for 63% of global deaths to 2016. It's now 71% and increasing, especially in, in low and middle income countries. COVID is exacerbating a lot of the challenges. We know that uh, patients with chronic diseases are suffering more and more from COVID. There is a huge demand for, uh, for, for healthcare that is going to get worse over the next five to 10 years. On the supply side, there is, a, there is a limit to how much supply can expand. So there is a need to train more healthcare workers. There is a need to get more and more workers out there. At least in my lifetime, I don't think we're going to have enough healthcare workers to meet the burgeoning demand uh, from healthcare consumers. There's a lot of data indicating that post-COVID, there's going to be a significant inflation in healthcare costs. The figure that you see on the right is coming out of some interesting work done in the US. But we see that in India as well. Uh, patients with chronic diseases are delaying elective surgeries. They're delaying going to the hospital. And all of this, we think, is going to add up to debt that's going to place even greater amount of, of strain on healthcare system. Uh, Mr. Vatikuri talked earlier about the lack of resources. We don't have the resources, financial resources or human resources, to keep up with the increase of healthcare in most countries around the world. It doesn't really matter if it's you know India or the developed countries. We don't have the resources to keep spending on healthcare the way we have over the over the last hundred years. So what's really needed is to start thinking out of box solutions to start containing and, and start addressing this huge demand uh, that we cannot address with the current supply side uh, models. So that's one lens that we take. The other lens that we take is just working with healthcare consumers over the last 10, uh, over the last 10 years, there has been a dramatic shift in what they expect. So one of the things that you know, we look a lot at is the, the, the journey of a healthcare consumer and the journey of the healthcare consumer cannot be framed only in the context of their health needs. These are also consumers who are consuming other products and services. And just the mobile revolution in the last 20 years has completely changed expectations of consumers around the world. 
healthcare is one of the few domains left where consumers don't have two things that they have in virtually everything choice and autonomy they don't uh, they don't have access to those things in healthcare very often people don't know what they are paying for uh, they don't know how to measure what uh, the impact of what they are paying for and so there is this there is this unique situation where healthcare consumers are not happy with what they are getting they don't know how to measure the impact of it but they want to be part of the discussion that was not the case two decades back now they want to be absolutely part of this discussion so there is this uh, there is this situation where demands going up supply side is not keeping up and healthcare consumers are demanding more and more out of healthcare systems so we see three models emerging there are healthcare systems that are still to my knowledge stuck in the 20th century just trying to operate the way they were operating you know 30 40 years back there are some healthcare systems that are trying to adapt to technology but essentially what they are doing is digitizing existing workflows they they still continue to operate the way they were operating 10 years back 20 years back they do they they insert a little technology in between so there's there's an app that that that's inserted but they really are not imagining or reimagining the patient workflows and the third huge group of digital health startups and both globally as well as in india who are trying to look at things from a consumer side but what what they don't end up doing is really integrating with what healthcare traditional healthcare supply chains are doing so in this scenario what we do is there's a lot of innovation that requires to be done on the supply side so you know i i'm not for one minute arguing that we don't need more healthcare workers we don't need more supply side innovation but our focus is to really get to patients and consumers where they are uh dr bandari talked about his uh, his uh, reticence for ai and I, i'll speak about what we are doing with ai as well but essentially what we think can be done is getting to patients and health consumers where they are and giving them the tools to start in, in investing in their own preventive health uh, solutions we built two assets to enable that the first is a digital platform which combines two product suites power.ai and intelligentia and i'll talk about that briefly so power.ai is essentially a digital pipe that we built it's a modular platform where you know i can deploy the platform to push out personalized behavior change communications to patients wherever they are so a patient with hypertension in mumbai can get a very different experience than a patient with hypertension and diabetes in delhi or a patient with hypertension diabetes uh, and uh, and and nephropathy in in bihar uh we can personalize the experience for them it's very modular it's driven it can be driven by a variety of variables so they all get a journey that's personalized to gender geography and also the stage of the journey that they are at for example a patient with 30 years of hypertension doesn't need the same behavior change communication or nudges that a than a patient who's newly been diagnosed with hypertension so 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 that's the digital pipe that allows us to get to patients wherever they are and we can deploy this to anywhere in the world in 8 to 12 weeks flat but equally importantly the same pipe is very very important to collect back the real world insights from patients most innovation at least on the pharmaceutical side is driven by patient data when they get to clinics or facilities and increasingly uh, most innovators are looking at understanding patient behaviors in within communities and we think that once you have the platform to reach patients where they are you also have the unique ability to capture their real world behaviors and their real world preferences and, and insights around those and use that to inform innovation so that's what power.ai does it's a way to get to a pay uh, intelligentia is a suite of ai based algorithms so we've deployed this platform in our index use case is for children's health in india we deployed it for parents of low to of uh, is in low to middle income communities for parents of children between 0 to 6 to drive them towards improvements in children's health and nutrition outcomes we collected data from from these users about 15 million health consumer data points and we built machine learning algorithms that allow us to do two things that we think are critical for digital engagement the first is it allows us to predict user churn on digital platforms and as many of you may know uh, digital churn is a real problem in healthcare about 97% of users churn off digital platforms within the first one month so just being able to understand profile and slice which profile of consumers are churning out at which point in their journey is very powerful to increase engagement with these consumers 
The second thing we've built is a Netflix style health recommender system that essentially allows us to increase the right kind of content that we can surface to these consumers. And we've shown a 50% increase in engagement with the use of this Netflix style health recommender system. So Pawai is a way to get to a consumer. Intelligentsia is a way to augment digital engagement to a point where we can actually get them to respond to the behavior change nudges. We also have a scientific and a creative communications team uh, whose job is to really craft the behavior change communication. And one of our biggest insights over the last 10 years of work, and we are applying that in Start Health, is that we tend to look at patients within healthcare, we tend to, to look at patients in a very siloed fashion. So a patient with diabetes is also a father, is also somebody who goes to work, and he or she doesn't get up in the morning looking forward to watching a YouTube video about diabetes, right? So when we create diabetes content, we should assume that this is not interesting. They don't want to do this. They would rather go watch something on Netflix or YouTube or TikTok. And I think why that insight is important is because as, as if we want to start shaping their communications, we have to start competing with the other things that are in the mind of that health consumer. So our, our behavior change communication needs to be interesting. It needs to be infotaining. It needs to be gamified. It needs to be interactive. All the stuff that consumer tech companies are doing. However, making sure that it doesn't get flippant. So that's been a big insight. How do you, to engage health consumers, you really have to compete with everything else that's going around in their lives. So this is a little bit about the, uh, the algorithms that we're building. They're very early stage for what we are building. We've, uh, we've uh, peer reviewed, uh, uh, we've published one paper. Our second paper is currently being peer reviewed, but there's a huge number of use cases that we think can be unfolded that we are working on essentially being able to inform healthcare organizations, giving them, being able to give them the understanding of which patients are likely to churn out at which point in their journey can be hugely important for us to start optimizing their, uh, their interaction. This is the work we've done with Children's Health. Our app is available. This is a free app that we've, uh, we've deployed with low to middle income communities. We used a lot of learnings from some of the leading consumer tech organizations. So our, our, in, uh, our approach was, you know, typically for Children's Health, most of the communication centers around, you know, if you don't vaccinate your child, you know, they will have these diseases. It's very negative, scary insinuations. And our, our communication is very positive, happy, aspirational. We've used a lot of gamification, which people initially, when we launched this in 2018, people thought that you know this is not for our consumers. You know, our the low-income communities are not ready for this, and we have seen that they are ready for this more than most other communities. We've seen such sophisticated mm -hmm. mobile behaviors from extremely low-income communities within Mumbai and within Uttar Pradesh that we've been blown away with what can happen if you put the right tools in their hands. Uh, we have a lot of impact data sh shifts in knowledge, shifts in behavior, and also shifts in purchasing uh, uh, purchasing practices around high nutrition products. I won't go into those into details. Some of the focus areas in which we work, we're really agnostic. Our platform is agnostic. As I mentioned earlier, these are some of the areas that we have worked in and we continue to work in. Um, and I just want to, yeah, I just want to end with a couple of things. I think uh, what the vision is, and I think we, I've grappled with this as well. I mean, Dr. Bhandari talked about this earlier. Telemedicine has been around. Uh, there's been an upsurge in telemedicine in the last year. Is it going to last? Maybe some of it will last organically because of the spillover effect of what's happening during the pandemic. But I feel that unless and until we start reimagining the, uh, the, the entire healthcare experience from a patient perspective, we, have, we run the risk of slipping back into old ways of doing business. And like I mentioned earlier, the old ways of doing business are just not sustainable. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources to keep doing that. And so we need to start reimagining what the healthcare system of the future looks like, putting first the patient at the center, then start thinking about the digital technologies around the patient, then the healthcare workers, then the doctor. And at the end, maybe we'll think about the brick and mortar in, uh, investments we need. Let's not start thinking of the future healthcare system you know, with a 300-bed hospital to start with, because a lot of people do that. Let's think of the patient, and that's the way to go if you really want to make sustainable changes to how we are virtualizing healthcare in the future. That's all for my comments right now. Um, I'd love to interact with the rest of the panelists and the audience uh, subsequently. Thank you, Dr. Bandari. Thank you, Dr. Ganju. Oh, before I go to the next uh, panelist, I would like to, I, a very exciting model of uh, rural India and all. Do you use really any gadgets for these uh, data collection so far, or uh, it just the question is? 
we just rely on the mobile phone that the users have right it, it needs to be data enabled but we come we... back to you at several places and i'll without wasting time let's have dr jaya dr jaya you know why i included you is not that your hard work was not implemented by the punjab government still it is gathering dust and as well as with the niti aayog but during the process i was part of this process and you did such an exhaustive exercise could you give a snapshot of what the regulatory framework is like to be is it going to be excuse me i am telling a bureaucrat a typical bureaucratic approach to the problem thinking of negatives first or they will open up and second thing is uh, you with your experience of these two startups what do you think is likely to be response and the term used by akash is the what would be the organic uh, growth of telemedicine or virtual medicine whatever you say back to you dr jaya thank you dr bandari i think uh, if i look back at uh, my experience in remote rural areas in india then even as a deputy commissioner of a district in arunachal pradesh way back in uh, 1985 to 1988 i was at a place where there was not even a telephone connection as the deputy commissioner of a district in india mainland india where i had to be airdropped by air force helicopters or i had to go along a uncertain track uh, which was uh, an urban track for some 200 kilometers which took me 10 12 hours after which i had to stay the night and then walk again along the road route which was still being developed uh, for another 50 kilometers which in the best of circumstances i could do in uh, 12 hours or so so from those days <coughs> when we had nothing today in that same district headquarters since i am still in touch with the current deputy commissioner in that place called anani he still is asked by his own state government that why does he not reply to an email message uh, for two weeks he says my net connection is so poor and my uh, cell phone connection is equivalent to only a 2g connection so we have enough places in india where we do not have more than a 2g connection so if you are looking at the last mile you are essentially looking at 2g not even 3g now if you go even in a normal village in india out of 10 people roughly one or maximum two would have a smartphone where they can use whatsapp and the other seven or 10 uh, will then be able to access that single smartphone which may be in a pharmacy shop or some other person which may be uh, anm it could be whoever which means they do have access to a smartphone and uh, within a let's say 102 meters 100 200 meters of wherever they are so then you realize that while on one end we are talking of high end platform so if i am ceo of one company that is uh, virtual sathi and that is modeled on lines similar to what akash has been talking ai based ultimately but there again we are realizing that we have to actually give our software ehr etc to a local area network in uh, smaller setups of ngos uh, in deep in the interior who are doing work on health uh, so which means they have a local area network and they install our software there and uh, we maintain it from a distance with an amc they keep the data with them and they do whatever they want if they want us to simply to keep the data then of course we are delighted because that gives us the uh, larger data set to then even when we have uh, firewalled it amongst let's say 100 ngos to combine it for uh, deep learning purposes ai driven solutions like akash is already working on but if i look at my experience of the last two days uh, with uh, the helpline of uh, a tv channel called aaj tak in india which is the hindi uh, counterpart of india today so we are part of a large group aims to health senior doctors uh, 
seven of us were uh, yesterday with them on a TV show introducing them uh, to this new uh, uh, 4-hour helpline in which 500 doctors would be present online, of which 10 are from uh, our firm, Aims to Health Limited. And we have repeated that today also for four hours. So our experience is that the nature of the problem and the nature of the solution that you need in those areas has absolutely nothing to do with the guidelines issued by the government of India or by AIMS New Delhi or by ICM or by Apple, which means these are city-centric guidelines. They do not take into account the reality of the rural area. So if I'm talking to these people in a remote rural area on a phone, which means I don't see their face, they don't see my face, they trust that I'm a good doctor simply because they trust Aj Tak. So it's the brand of Aj Tak. I am nameless, faceless, and I'm only on a phone line. And uh, if some of them happen to have seen the program that day, uh, in the preceding hour, then of course they know who the a guy with a turban uh, was on the screen and I say I'm the same guy. So they can relate to my face. But beyond that, they don't really comprehend what is AIMS New Delhi or what is the capability of any doctors in our team. So if we say you have to, if you have nothing and you are at home and I so you have to be in home isolation. Now, these people are generally speaking in one or two rooms in the rural setup. Sometimes only one room. And then one person, when he falls sick, he's actually shifted to a thrashed hut outside. And in that thrashed hut, if he served anything, he's served by tying it to a long pole, which is then delivered to him. And even though he's asymptomatic for all practical purposes, even on the 14th, 15th day, they continue to do that, not knowing that he is non-infectious after 10 days. So you can see the communication challenge with these areas, that they have not heard about anything. If state governments have made protocols which uh, require government doctors to prescribe medicines, which we all know have no role whatsoever. So for example, the state government of Uttar Pradesh, till I last saw their circular, still has three top medicines, which include doxycycline, azithromycin, and uh, Ivermectin as a part of a standard prescription for any patient of uh, COVID or suspected COVID, irrespective of the time or seriousness that he presents him or himself or herself. And this, therefore, is causing more problems than others. And in the urban areas, this is definitely causing QT prolongation in some patients. So instead of helping, it's causing nausea, vomiting, and QT prolongation. And if you stop all these things, people recover. If you continue these things, they are sick. So in these rural areas, well, fortunately, they don't have most of this. But then they don't even have a thermometer. And you can't, therefore, talk to them of an oximeter. Because they have no way of getting an oximeter. So if you don't have a thermometer, if you don't have an oximeter, then you have to teach them uh, how to count respiratory rate. So you first ask them in the local language, whether you are, uh, you are out of breath or not on, uh, at rest or after walking a few steps. So most of them may not even have a watch. So counting six minutes makes no sense for them. So talking of a six minute test or trying to explain its niceties to them and of, a, uh, of an oximeter, you are totally out of this. Now, some of them in remote rural areas or urban slums, uh, do have uh, a surgical mask at best. And some of them are smart enough to use a mask morning till evening and discard it. So even 17-year-olds are capable of doing so. And even though they are, uh, I mean, uh, their father is only having a roadside uh, tailor on which he sells pani food. But the boy is articulate enough to ask me these questions that if I have a two-room uh, house in which I live, how should I manage with uh, uh, home quarantine? So, which means the level of understanding of people in this carry category is fantastic. Even in Delhi, uh, a gardener, a Mali as we call him, who earns barely 9,000, 10,000 rupees, 
who did not have oximeter for five days, someone gave an oximeter to him. Not only was he using the oximeter, even though he's practically illiterate, he was maintaining the chart almost as well as any trained nurse would do in terms of recording the oxygen level, the pulse rate and temperature. Uh, and any particular issues uh, on that day. So, uh, yes, he has a smartphone given to him by somebody. Uh, so with that mere management, this man is able to send me pictures of all the medicines that I have prescribed. He is able to give it to the wife. Both were very sick. She was extremely sick. Her oxygen levels uh, in her oximeter were consistently less than 60 for two full days. She went to five different Delhi hospitals. The, she could not enter the main gate of the hospital. Why? Because they were considered to be too poor to be even let in. Why? Because the hospitals were overflowing with patients because even those who are well off cannot even get in. So I have patients who, whose uh, children earn packages upward of 50 lakhs who went to hospital had to come back with their uh, father and grandmother, or both of whom had oxygen levels around 80%. And managing them at home uh, was not a challenge with an ordinary oxygen cylinder or the concentrator. Uh, but in this gar farm, uh, gardener's case, there was no oxygen. So all one did was give her a medicine which cost two rupees per tablet, which is dexamethasone, and twice a day, and for within three days, her, oxy, her oxygen levels had gone back on the same oximeter from 60 to 80 in one day and 90 in the second day and 93 in the third day. And in the next week, she maintained herself at that level throughout. And in terms of history taking, what we have done is we have written a, a three page form with questions which they can either print out or if they can't print out and fill it in, they can note the question number and against that write whatever, whether by uh, voice recording or in Hindi or English or any other language. Well, in our bed, most of these people have been in doing it in English and Hindi. So the net result is that you have one set of people who can only do it with you on an ordinary phone. So it's a challenge even sending this to them, but you can ask them questions, they will answer correctly as well as you and I would answer, <clears throat> and they are not educated. The second set is who will uh, note down the questions and I mean answers and put the number and uh, WhatsApp it back to you. The third set is who have an access to a printer directly or indirectly print it and then write against it in longhand and send a photo on WhatsApp to you. A fourth set is who work online, who create a proper digital document and send the document to you. A fifth category is who put that document on Google Drive and send you a link on uh, WhatsApp. And within these various categories, there are people amongst them who, for example, send me a list of questions every day that they want to ask me about the patient's progress. Uh, they then have a 15 minute or half hour session with me on the patient. Uh, these are youngsters in their 30s who are doing this for their father or grandmother. But even 50 year old women who are otherwise, let's say teaching English somewhere are sending me a half a page note explaining on the WhatsApp, what medicine was given at what time, what did the patient eat, what were the challenges during the day, once a day, I'm given this uh, input in writing. And the smarter ones are putting it on the digital form at one place where I only get a link. So this kind of monitoring is possible for at least 10 to 20 serious patients who otherwise should have been in the ICU at home. And some of these patients are, one is a hemiplegic, a second one has chronic renal failure, uh, most of them have diabetes. Some of them have poorly controlled diabetes and all of them are on steroids. So the common thing amongst them is all of them are steroids. Some are getting oxygen uh, sparingly because they get a small cylinder which lasts even at half a liter per minute speed only for uh, hour and a half or two. So if 
they run it at full speed, which means two, three liters is what the patient needs, then it goes away in one hour, but they have to wait in a queue for seven hours to get the next refill, which lasts one and a half hours. So if the family has two people, nobody can go. If both are sick, there is no one to cook, which means you also now need to help them with uh, someone to supply them everything they need. So I'm working with three NGOs. So one NGO will probably end up giving them uh, oxygen cylinder. Another one would be giving them a concentrator. A third one would be lending them on a returnable basis, a uh, oximeter and a thermometer. And a fourth one is giving them uh, either rations if they are able to cook, otherwise cooked food. And of course, neighbors are giving one meal and uh, office colleagues are giving the third colleague. So there are people earning 50,000 rupees who are in debt because they did not have one lakh rupees ready with them to uh, pay for the rental of an oxygen concentrator. And also the upfront payment for uh, using it for 10 days, 80,000 plus 20,000, one lakh. They had at best 50,000 with them and now they had no, no money left for medicines or anything else. So which means you also give them food, you do everything. And you do it at a cost which is negligible. And if on social media or any of these NGOs, if you get to them, you are able to do everything without any difficulty with the results which are absolutely unimaginable. So what I'm trying to say is the world does, I'm, this I cannot put them out till they at least complete one month. And most of them have completed three weeks. And of all these people, only one had to be sent to hospital, but within six hours of his coming to me because he was uncooperative, young, no comorbidities, and they were keen to take him to hospital. And they couldn't naturally find a hospital anywhere near. They were well-connected, very rich. They took him all the way to a city called Namashair in Punjab. They drove through the night, reached at 4 a.m. He was in a wonderful ICU, lasted a 15 days, but in the ICU, they were giving him Instead of 8 milligrams uh, dexamethasone, 20 milligrams dexamethasone, because that is, seems to be the consensus amongst the inter intensivists working in ICUs in Punjab. So this is what I'm seeing happen. I have patients where they have been started on uh, 1 milligram uh, kg per kg body weight methylprednisolone on day one, simply because their CRP levels were raised to 40 or 50 or because they were old and they had no comorbidities. So which means these are cardiologists, nephrologists, internal medicine people, and sometimes pulmonologists who are doing these kind of funny things in India, which I just can't comprehend. I mean, if it's an illiterate ordinary doctor who went to an ordinary college and hasn't required the time to look up anywhere. So <clears throat> Randeep Guleria, for example, as director of AIMS and as a key figure coming on TV so regularly, keeps harping the fact that they should not be giving any steroids in the first week unless oxygen levels fall. It doesn't seem to make any difference. People are so blind that they want to take on, uh, I mean, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, even a very famous cardiologist in Delhi who uh, has been propagating the use of steroids from day one, uh, who runs an NGO and that NGO therefore also has been giving uh, steroids from day one, that same cardiologist now has ended up in an ICU because of his own deeds himself. So this is the situation in Delhi. And if we are looking at the last mile, there is last mile in Delhi also on all aspects. So today, for example, in one of the helpline cases in Rohini in Delhi, I had a call from an elderly lady around 80 years of age saying, I have gone and taken both my shots, first and second. My husband, who's 85, cannot climb stairs. He, he can neither go down nor come up. We are on the first floor. So how can I get the vaccine? This is bang in Delhi. So now I will have to find a way to get the vaccine for this old man who's only asking me how to get it, not whether or not and this or that. So in, if, if this is the last mile problem in Delhi in relation to uh, vaccination, for the elderly who are high risk, who were the first priority, then you can imagine what is the situation in Delhi. Then another patient came to me again uh, because someone gave her number because he saw her sitting on a charpa in the street in Pahargan, in Delhi. 
and her only request to me was i have no money to buy uh, oxygen for my cylinder i don't have corona but i have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for which i was hospitalized and now that cylinder is khali every day otherwise i would be given by passers by or the open shops something worth 200 rupees 300 rupees which took care of all my needs now i don't have that income my brother who lives in the house who's thrown me out drinks three days a week next other three days he earns 300 out of which he gives 150 to the wife with two children we have not paid electricity bill for the last eight uh, six seven eight years which is eighteen thousand rupees so we are living in darkness so kindly can you help with another two three thousand rupees so that we survive for a month now this is happening in Delhi, where Kejriwal says anyone who has any problem will solve it. So, which means the last mile problem, not just on health, on every scheme under the sun, is there in Delhi even today. The Mohalla clinics, which were the famed Mohalla clinics, don't seem to exist anymore. So, if this is the last mile problem in Delhi, then imagine the problem in remote rural areas where someone from a village in one district of Rajasthan called me to say because he knew the DSP of Mahendragar district in Haryana who was related to him, that his relative is admitted in the ICU and I don't even understand what the ICU guys are trying to tell me. He, he, they get no feedback from the patient, uh, of the patient to the relatives. The nurse fortunately came on the line, so I know what was being done. And all I can say is that the treatment being given in that Sarkari ICU was not in conformity with the state government's guidelines because the state government on paper is following the central government guidelines from 22nd of April and this is an I mean, I'm talking of a uh, discussion after that and I know why the state government is doing that because the advisor to the chief minister is a batchmate of mine and I asked him are you, are you still giving ivermectin azithromycin and uh, uh, so to cut myself short uh, what I want to say is that civil society and startups in India are doing a fantastic job. So uh, we have, for example, Mayupchar, which is doing a massive job in Hindi, in UP and neighboring states. We have uh, Jio, J I Y O, again by another entrepreneur, Young Boys, who is doing through uh, the so called village Jola Chap doctors work at the village level uh, in a manner in which the Jhola Chap doctors are part of the solution and in a system where the MBBS doctors are a part of the problem. So this is complete reversal of what you normally talk of when you say the doctor is the solution through telemedicine. Here I am saying no, even the doctor is not the solution, it's the local person in the village who is the solution and aims okay, to help. Yeah. Yeah. Jaya, I think I would like to bring you back in discussion. I think yeah. I wish whatever you are doing could partly be understood by our allopathic or hospital care, because that right. is what India needs, it's known as a comprehensive medicine. is not writing a prescription on remitsevir. You are responsible of making sure that patient gets remitsevir. We'll come back to you, because I really want to go through the formal presentations of the please, panelists. Please, yeah quickly so that we can have a real lively discussion. Prateek, can you briefly tell us, because you are the one who have collected large data on surveys on uh, the uh, healthcare with gadgets, home monitoring in, in, you know, in wellness programs. So if you could bring in your experience and then we have Tanvi and then we'll open up for the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Jaya, for a very good. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhandari, and it's great to listen to uh, Dr. Ganju and Dr. Singh about the rural insights because I think these are a valuable insight uh, considering the large part of the country today reside in those scenarios. Now, what I'm going to do is a little bit different here. Uh, so my data points, my presentation really uh, will talk about more from the urban scenario. So, uh, you know, I so what I tend to do here is not to really... Uh, you know, bog you all down with the numbers and, and the data points. Uh, I'm really over next 10 to 15 minutes going to present you the insights that we have collected. And I've been fortunate to really work in a lot of emerging markets. 
but i think india the insights that we have generated are really valuable and much different as compared to any other emerging market so i'll just directly uh, deep dive into it uh, i'll take a leaf from dr uh, akash's uh, presentation when he talked about how there is a uh, you know non relevant integration if i can call that uh, in the traditional healthcare approach to what we are experiencing today so if we look at the conventional healthcare models uh it's pretty much a primary care physician and a hospital this is what we have all been through for for a you know large part of the uh you know of last uh, about 30 40 years and then about 10 15 uh, years ago there is an advent where technology intervened but again it was a uh, i would like to call it a, a forced intervention between what was a traditional mode and there was a technology which came into you know into into being but without a proper integration without proper uh, properly developing the workflows which otherwise would have really made a lot of sense now today what is happening is and and that's what uh, you know i'm going to talk about towards the end of the presentation uh, something that i would like to term as healthcare 3.0 this healthcare 3.0 basically is uh, collecting the puzzle pieces the silos which are operating i mean so let me explain this you know all, there are so many pieces around that there are so many silos in the healthcare infrastructure which are functioning uh, super efficiently but the problem is they are not functioning all together so what will be the picture like when we put all of these things together and how efficiently this will improve the healthcare system today in india so when we talk about a healthcare uh, scenario overall uh you know really so i would like to break it down into into three primary blocks interactive care remote patient monitoring and asynchronous care now interactive care is you know we i am sure that all the people in the room today here uh, have experienced in some way or the other the interactive care interactive care is nothing but a uh, basic interaction with our physicians with the cardiologist with the doctor an expert uh, maybe a you know video consultation a telephonic co consultation where we are highlighting our symptoms and and they are really probing us with the questions and then giving us a, a prescription or a further care plan putting us on a care pathway now to make this interactive care more and more engaging more and more fruitful uh, there is a intervention of remote patient monitoring the most important block according to me in the entire healthcare ecosystem now the remote patient monitoring uh, essentially not only gives us valuable data points but it also ensures that we have a long term picture of so it's like creating a clone of an individual for a very for a very long term what we were 10 years ago and what we are today if we have to really map it down medically that is what remote patient monitoring is capable of doing so of course we can't go back in time and and get those data points but at least we can build a lot of touch points and data points for next 10 15 years and so on which will give us a very very important interactive care and improve the health healthcare ecosystem a synchronous care uh, typically uh, you know uh, this is to just to, just to give you an example of a synchronous care we scan our prescriptions our reports send it out to the doctors they look at that and maybe send an whatsapp message or a or a email uh, in of their opinion on that particular report now again this was working in silo in some cases pretty efficiently but i'll talk about you know what happens when we really club this up with a virtual healthcare ecosystem one of the things that has really evolved well over last i would say 5 uh, or 6 years is the predictive care now what is predictive care this is essentially predicting what is going to happen to me uh, over next two or three years uh, we have gone to a stage where we can even predict heart heart failures heart attacks that maybe in a couple of years uh, there's a 90% chance that in a couple of years possibly i'll have a heart attack and how we are able to do that is by the integration of machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms again you know i'll talk a little bit more about it as we go ahead but one of the key input data points for this machine learning and artificial intelligence is the remote patient monitoring data uh when i talked about the interactive care let's go one level up in the interactive care and when we double click this we find that it not only really helps us take care of what uh, problem we are facing today but more critical issues so i'll give you an example in in africa for an instance uh, in a remote place uh, far away from the capital city where the infrastructure is poor where there is no physician doctor or a specialist to look at the data today we are cutting down a time of 24 to 30 hours to diagnose an ecg down to 6 minutes and all that is possible because of the uh, integration of ai with the interactive care i talked about remote patient monitoring the data points we are generating and the decision making which is aiding the entire system 
asynchronous care it actually can also you know with the technology advent it also can help us largely uh, to monitor the responses we are getting out of the uh, out of the care which we are receiving from the physicians now when we talk about the virtual healthcare from indian perspective and these are some of the points that insights that we have generated in last year during the covid period there was a window of about 4 to 5 months uh, which really helped us understand these uh, challenges and again as i said that these are more urban in nature so probably it may not be uh, very effective when when i talk about the rural india what dr singh and dr ganju talked about but more importantly from tier 2 tier 3 cities uh, and 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 the urban uh, cities in india so one thing is that uh, you know people did acknowledge and i'll again talk about some deloitte numbers here in the next slide that there is a huge reduced lead time why because we don't have to sit in the patient uh, you know as a patient in the doctor chamber or outside their chamber waiting for the consultations attention span is wider and better because now they have the remote patient monitoring data points available so they can make more informed decisions so rather than writing a test and asking you to come back and follow up here what they are going to do is essentially look at the data which is already available on the dashboards on the ehr systems continuous monitoring is another piece because when we are on remote patient monitoring i think we generate an enormous amount of data which uh, which is which is so valuable that it not only can give you a better access to the uh, to the healthcare it can also define a lot of timely detection of critical conditions for an instance heart failure cost uh, you know reduction is obvious because you are visiting hospital uh, much lesser it's only for critical cases or surgeries visits are much lower in number adherence to medication is improved now because your doctor your your healthcare provider can see what exactly you are doing with the dashboard data that we are filling on a each day then uh, you know i talked about the uh, the remote patient monitoring data set that we are generating the long term data set that we are generating this allow uh you know this allows more accurate diagnosis because it's not one off uh you know uh, diagnosis it's a diagnosis over 5 years 10 years maybe couple of years but it's a it's a long enough diagnosis uh, long enough data points to give you more accurate diagnosis and identification of unknown comorbidities one of the highlights of the data that we collected uh you know in those 5 6 months window lot of people did not even know that uh you know diabetes for example can ultimately lead to a heart failure this is of course because of uh, lack of uh, you know uh, lack of education lack, lack of knowledge on on these uh, data points but you know a simple problem as diabetes can ultimately lead to a to a, it can act as a comorbidity for a heart failure so the, you know these are interesting data set which allowed us to really evaluate how the indian population is is faring basically in the in the current times uh, with a less access to healthcare and of course you know higher efficiencies because now medical resources can be used in alternate ways because the cramped systems are less cramped up at this point in time now what are the outcomes so i talked about some you know numbers uh, that you know delight delight has collected from these virtual healthcare points so over 50% physicians really see enhanced coordination because now uh, the patient is more responding more receptive to what is being told and more uh you know adherence to protocols which are being offered to them uh then over two third surveys uh they rate they rated the consumer experience far better as compared to their physical visits down to the hospitals uh on an average per visit they would be able to save as much as 2 hours you know remove the travel time remove the time you're waiting to see a doctor you know queuing up in the in the billing counters and so on so it's a huge efficiency that is building into the system uh and then of course uh you know it expands the consumer and physician access because people who were earlier not able to get this uh, these appointments and and, uh, and access to the physicians who is far away is now much easily available now coming to some of the compliance and technical challenges that we have identified so it's not always goody goody as we as we progress because of course there are a lot of uh you know good points when we talk about the remote patient monitoring or virtual healthcare but it does come with it own set of technical and compliance challenges from the patient point of view adaptability we figured is pretty low so newer and newer devices are getting introduced in the market it's it becomes very difficult for a lot of patients to really uh, you know to adhere to those or to adapt to those technologies now one of the silver linings i'll call of covid 19 is that people have become more receptive to adopt these new technologies adopt this uh, you know basically they are they are more receptive to the technologies now 
uh, protocol adherence is low we we know in our own lives that if we have to start a new habit or or we have to take some uh, you know measurements for example vitals uh, for a long period of time we do that for 10 15 20 days but we often tend to then fall off uh, and the adherence is, is not very high and and that's that's pretty obvious because you know this is not something which is part of our regular routines that we have been doing all through our lives the readings are irregular and measurements are not very accurate in certain instances because people do not have a very good knowledge about which devices to buy which are compliant devices uh, which devices are calibrated non calibrated so that is one thing that we tried addressing uh, during that window and then again lack of understanding because use of the machine again is important criteria uh, to have successful readings and measurements out uh, so far the delivery uh, is only data driven and uh, and so i mean basically it's a, it's a live interactive discussions when needed with the doctors with your physicians but asynchronous delivery as i said also plays a important part when we have enormous amount of data through these data collection devices network availability connectivity of course we have in india we have really uh, come far uh, you know the old age when we had huge amount of data challenges uh, but it's even now you know in in some of the uh, some of the uh, you know tier 2 tier 3 towns we see the availability of network and connectivity is not as good uh, dr singh talked about the regulatory framework and it really holds true it's a different topic altogether so i'll not dig di uh, dig deep into that but that's another uh, you know technical issue in the entire system and then as i said in the beginning i think all the key components working in silos is the biggest challenge so quickly over next couple of minutes i'll talk about some of the elements which are required to really improve this patient compliance so the first of it's data management now we 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 see how these uh, you know so doctor is working at their own chambers talking to the patient getting some data writing prescriptions which are offline prescriptions then we have uh, you know patients who have some data points collected written on the whatsapp messages lost in the sea of messages uh, further down we have uh, you know we go to a particular lab get the hard copy of reports no record of the, those data so centralization of data is super important first thing that we should really look at is how can we develop the ehr systems uh, and have the data a synchronous and synchronous data system which is the digital data as well as your uh, hard copy of data converted down uh, to a easy to store and process data and actionable insight most importantly because what good is the data if we cannot really action that data and and bring it to the uh, to the benefit of the patient uh, adoption of technology and workflows are very important dr ganju talked about it uh, i reiterate that uh, we have to really improve our upon our existing workflows to include the virtual care as a part of the care giving in the Uh, in the virtual healthcare ecosystem it's super important we can't do without unifying the offline and online approaches we can't i mean no approach can really function well without the other uh, if we have to really develop a combined ecosystem it has to really become a plan a from plan b we have to uh, really unify devices make the online consultations all the tele consultations as the primary mode right now what we are doing is we are using it as a plan b when we can't visit to a particular doctor again i'll not really go deep into data security and privacy but we all know that possibly if you know if, if given a choice we would trust a bank uh, system more as compared to a uh, online medical record systems right so we have all our uh, you know for example cards credit cards and and saving accounts uh, our our loan accounts and what not all linked into one particular system which we trust with because we know these are very highly secured uh, you know databases similar kind of thing really need to evolve in the healthcare space where people where the patients can trust uh, you know these uh, data security uh, uh, databases and then uh, really be open to share that data across uh, you know when it goes to the down to the doctor level uh, then one of the key important part is selection of hardware it is super important that these hardwares are very very simple uh, you know this is one thing that i personally feel is is a very big deterrent in adoption of the technology which is uh, we load the patient up with five different uh, and i know in the audience there are people who are listening who have really uh, experienced this in last last year uh, when we ran this pilot and i think one of the things is that this has to be really simplified it has to reduce time improve the compliance and the touch points have to be really limited and the device selection has to be really need based we cannot have five or six devices lined up for people who are for example just battling with diabetes or or blood pressure for an instance so it has to be really customized approach 
one of the things that i i strongly believe in uh, that can really change the entire game is the integration of ai and machine learning we have the data but as i said what good is that data if we can't really make sense of that data so uh, i have a slide which will really tell you what amazing thing we can do if we really mine that data into the right direction predictive diagnosis i talked about in the beginning that is super important uh, for a for a futuristic virtual healthcare ecosystem and it cannot uh, it cannot be done it cannot be taken care without leaving ai and machine learning algorithms into the entire uh, you know in, into the entire block most importantly last but most important is the user experience and interface this is something that we really all of us uh, when we ran this pilot i think we figured that uh, the experience was probably not seamless there were connectivity issues because most of these devices are bluetooth enabled uh, people did find a bit of difficulty to sync the devices to their mobile systems uh, it was it was uh, you know device driven it has to be device agnostic it can it should really function with any any sort of device and a single platform care pathway uh, should be able to govern the entire data that we are collecting in the process so integration of device diagnosis consultation and patient monitoring unless that happens on a single platform this uh, these are all still going to work in silos now i have taken this slide up from from trico where uh, you know i'm currently working in some international markets so i'll tell you very quickly what the power of the ai and machine learning here is so i talked about right that uh, typically in a in a very remote uh, town remote city an ecg or echocardiography can take anywhere between 24 to 48 uh, or even 72 hours to get diagnosed now comes the power of the uh, uh, artificial intelligence engine what it does is the data is picked up from those devices on a real time basis transferred onto the cloud systems which are again hipaa protected cloud systems now these cloud systems have algorithms built in and these algorithms the machine learning uh, algorithms which are there really process that data and put up the classifiers put up the data points which are uh, which are basically uh, which are the issues so for an instance in a ecg if it's a abnormal or a critical ecg it really highlight that those points on to uh, you know and and goes uh, go, i mean sends the data back to the cardiologist now what happens is a cardiologist who has possibly 500 ecgs lined up to be diagnosis he or she knows that this is a critical ecg we need to prioritize that look at from their expert perspective send the report out within 6 minutes so this is what the power of ai can do really uh, cut down the time from hours and days to minutes and really save enormous amount of patient life so i'll just conclude here uh, by talking about the way forward uh, i told in the beginning that i'll sum up in a in a slide how this should look like pictorial i'll show in the next slide but one of the things that that should really pick up well and i think in the us it has already started uh, really uh, picking up uh, you know initial level india we are little away from that which is the over the air data uploads really eliminating the need of uh, connectivity tools like bluetooth which is cumbersome for the patients to operate on uh, this ecg part which i told you it's completely data driven there is absolutely zero human touch so here the data is taken automatically everything is uploaded and automatically the report is out so that's the kind of efficiency that we should be looking at in the virtual healthcare scenario post operative care doctor should really mandate that all the patients who are basically on a post operative care should really be part of a of a virtual healthcare system one to improve their adaptability to the system and second of course to make sure that the adherence to the protocol is taken care of there are so many devices out available in the market which are multi functional devices now so a single device can take a bp as well as a ecg similarly a, a, a you know healthcare band for example fitness band for example can take tens of data points and these are the these uh, you know accurate devices are the future in the virtual healthcare space health scoring is pretty important again a very detailed topic but this basically aligns the doctor how the patient is improving or regressing in terms of their uh, you know response to the medication and the protocols which are being followed predictive modeling i talked about what can happen in couple of months down the line three years down the line we know what measures we have to take early detection of heart failure is a common very common example here we know that we are at early stage what all things we need to do to prevent a final stage heart failure and similarly we talked a lot about the workflow to integrate the virtual and physical healthcare elements and setting an uh, care setting which is agnostic of whatever uh, you know dashboards are available whatever devices are available so here what it should look like right we have 
clinic and primary centers and tertiary care hospital we can't do away with it you ha you have to have a surgery you have to go down to a tertiary care hospital of course the efficiency will improve with the virtual care home care and remote patient monitoring will feed a enormous amount of valuable data for the decision making of the uh, of the doctors and and improved outcomes the machine learning and ai aided algorithms and centralized database will help uh, you know uh, mine that data the remote patient monitoring data and really make sense of that data and do a predictive modeling and then of course the tele consultations the care coordinations really uh, will take the enormous amount of load on the indian infrastructure healthcare infrastructure which is currently present and finally this would become to me a compliant virtual healthcare ecosystem so i'll stop my uh, talk here and i have the data points if anyone wants to really uh, double click and dive deep into it i can share that across but that's all from my end thank you dr bandari thank you pratik uh, i think your presentation gives me one clear insight the devices alone are not going to work until because a lot of people i have seen buy these devices middle class and all until you create a ecosystem until you build a value chain until you get into interventions and get an outcome so i think this makes a, and i think three speakers have done a wonderful job in creating a background because i wanted to bring tanvi at the top because she has a global experience and i wanted to learn for myself how that global experience can be translated into inter internal indian situation so i think without much i will hand over to tanvi to talk about her experience with vita health thank you dr bandari and and to everybody on the call um it's a pleasure to be here and i uh, have also learned quite a bit uh over the course of the presentation so thank you um i will try and keep this brief uh so that we have some time for q and a Uh, my name is Thanvi. I'm the co-founder of a company that is based out of the U.S. called Veda Health. Veda meaning intelligent, um, and we were really founded on a, a very simple premise of um, empowering patients to better self-manage when they're not directly in a care setting. Um, these numbers, I think, are have been have been mentioned numerous times on this call. But chronic disease is um, the kind of plague of this generation. um one in three adults self suffer from multiple chronic conditions and uh it's not a new problem but covid-19 has really shed light on this uh more than 90% of covid-19 mortalities are linked to patients with at least one underlying condition many of which are chronic COPD heart failure diabetes etc and so there's been a really strong impetus to act um in the last 18 months that we've we've been living through this um managing chronic conditions in traditional healthcare models is extremely challenging um you know as a as a patient you spend very little time actually with your healthcare provider and the sum of your health is really what happens day to day in all of those settings and the 90% of the time that you are spending away from your healthcare provider and so it's really looking at how do we bring healthcare into the home setting and into that day to day environment and um in the US at least in in the last 18 months um uh, there's a huge percent of the population that actually delayed and forewent healthcare um due to risk of exposure of covid-19 and i imagine that to be the case in in many other parts of the world um and so not only are we taking a problem that was challenging it's being compounded um being compounded by the realities of today um and that's all to say you know with covid it's added another dimension but these as i think dr gunju had said earlier these are real problems that have existed for a long time um a patient gets a diagnosis they are motivated uh because they're just learning about the condition um and then they go through this winding road of trying to understand their diagnosis trying to understand their medication regimen trying to stay motivated maybe not seeing the results that they were hoping to um and really only um understanding what is happening at a 6 month time interval and and maybe best case 3 month time interval when they go back to see their provider and so you know all of these things together have really have really highlighted our need for more transformative care um dr kanju had hit on this point um we have more and more patients and people and sicker people 
and our healthcare resources are not increasing to meet that need. And so um, really having solutions in place that enable us to increase that provider to patient ratio and to risk manage and, and triage patients more effectively is one of the key solutions. Um, remote care and self-management, actually putting the power into the hands of patients to better understand their conditions and to have more contextualized feedback is, is another um, key need. And then the third is really around this patient-generated data from our standpoint. And we, we term patient-generated data fairly broadly. Remote patient monitoring is nestled within that and other data that we're gathering from patients about lifestyle, about symptomatic factors, all of that coming together can really contextualize the support for the patient and be brought into the clinical experience and the clinical record. Uh, one of the, as I think Prithik had said, silver linings of COVID has been just a rapid adoption in telehealth and virtual care. Um, we as a company at, at Veda Health have been around for about five years and so much of what we have done has existed and, and been under this umbrella of innovation, so to speak. And as you think about working with different folks across the healthcare industry, virtual care and remote care, we're, we're very much in this kind of innovation umbrella. Um, but what we've seen in the U.S. is, you know, nearly half of Medicare, meaning government insured beneficiaries were accessing telehealth, and that was less than a percent a year ago. Um, and Deloitte actually con conducted a study where um, they asked patients their preferences around how they access care. And um, many of them, 90% believe that they can better manage their conditions with monitoring, and over 50% uh, would actually switch healthcare providers in order to get that mo specialized monitoring. Um, and then one thing we didn't really touch on, I think, in this discussion is um, how is this care accessed and paid for? And, um, you know, there's a whole regulatory framework around it. Um, what we are seeing across global markets and for context, Beta Health works in the U.S. and Europe primarily, um, we're moving from this kind of um, fee-for-service model, meaning we go and pay for each intervention, um, each visit to the doctor, individually to a more outcome-driven model. And so much of um, what is driving this um, adoption of healthcare technology in the U.S. is to enable best, better risk mitigation strategies to move more to this outcome-based model. So, uh, you know, a few things that we are seeing in terms of trends in the market, um, a huge need for being able to predict and identify patient gaps in care. Um, again, coming back to that concept that 90% of the time patients spend is not in a care setting, being able to direct uh, specified therapies, treatments, and lifestyle um, factors to patients where they are, um, more efficient care coordination. Uh, I, Prithik had mentioned, you know, healthcare exists in silos right now, and, and we see that really across the board. So while you may have heart failure and see your cardiologist, your primary care doctor may not know um, what is happening with your treatment regimen and, and really having people in place and systems in place to help patients navigate um, those transitions in care. Um, digital therapeutics, of course, are becoming a huge part of um, the healthcare landscape. So uh, condition-specific and evidence-based interventions um, through you know, the technologies that we use day to day. Um, consumer friendly monitoring. So actually um, bringing that healthcare experience into the fold of patients' lives in a way that they actually want to engage, feel motivated, but it also isn't burdensome on how they live day to day. And then being able to escalate that to video visits and, and things that are again, um, a, the appropriate modality, not every um, healthcare intervention requires an in-person visit, but we need to be able to have the data to intelligently drive um, where patients go. So a little bit about us as a company. Um, we are a digital disease management company. We improve care plan adherence and health outcomes for chronically ill patients and primarily chronically ill adults. Um, there are three key tenants to what we do, uh, behavior-driven engagement. So really looking at the behavioral science of why people do what they do, what motivates them. Um, and we apply that to the clinical context to keep them adherent to their guidelines. 
Um, the second part is really, again, coming back to this concept of patient voice, patient voice coming from their devices, coming from surveys, coming from passive and active data that we gather through um, surveys, cell phones, et cetera. Um, and then the third is coming back to the clinical experience. Um, we hear so often from physicians and clinicians that we work with that they don't need more data. What they need is more insights. The raw data is actually not that meaningful to them. But how do you translate that into something that they can say, you know, for my patient, I know that based on this information coming in and not a hundred data points that I need to sift through, uh, we need to make a medication change or medication titration. So um, these are kind of the three pillars of Beta Health and, and our approach to the market. Um, what we do at Beta Health is we deploy digital care pathways to patients on a condition specific basis, um, but from their clinician. So from their primary care doctor, from their specialist. And so that really facilitates a closer connection between provider and patient. Uh, we take an ecosystem approach to this. So um, we uh, integrate with a number of wearable devices. Um, our experience over the past five years has really shown that Bluetooth is incredibly challenging for the market that has the burden of chronic disease right now. Um, and so we primarily work with cellular enabled devices. Um, I think this has some implication for, you know, the rural areas in India, um, as we were talking about with, you know, 2G, 3G connections. Um, we also have a workflow component where we enable um, clinicians to uh, take advantage of this remote care platform and, and this whole approach because one of the biggest challenges that we've seen is that most, um, most folks uh, don't have the um, adoption of this within the clinical practice itself. Um, and part of our platform is looking at, you know, the risk mitigation and auto triage. So not every patient's needs are the same. Some patients benefit from device monitoring, some benefit from a digital care pathway. And based on, you know, the patient phenotype, uh, date of diagnosis, and a lot of other variables, we're actually able to push them down these personalized care pathways um, that have um, content that's really specified to the patient himself or herself. So... I know we, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll get into the results part, which I know Dr. Bhandari had, had wanted to cover. Um, we've run a, a number of studies, uh, clinical studies, on the impact of this technology within the healthcare provider setting, um, specifically one on uh, the impact of remote monitoring on heart failure readmissions. Um, and what we are hearing, you know, kind of loud and clear from providers is um, this is essential. We were able to reduce uh, readmissions by 75% between the investigational and control group and patients report feeling better cared for, more security, knowing that somebody is really um, watching over them in, in these really vulnerable moments um, in, in their lives and in their healthcare experiences. Um, and then we also work in the life sciences space. So just another data point around um, a study that we did alongside uh, Roche Diagnostics, um, we were able to um, to generate interventions on asymptomatic patients through remote patient monitoring. We were getting about 26 data points per vital per month per patient, um, uh, 7.8 clinician and patient satisfaction. And these are interventions that would not have happened without this type of monitoring. Um, you know, one patient had a pacemaker implanted because of the data that was coming through. So it's really, you know, from our perspective about this opportunity to move healthcare from a reactive patient initiate patient initiated model to a more proactive model where patients can be um, followed and understood, and then they can be directed to the appropriate intervention or care setting based on uh, the sum of their their day to day experiences. And I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Bindari. I think, uh, thank you very much. One question I have, Tanvi, from your presentation. You have such a documentative study, which I alluded at the beginning of my presentation. That's what I meant by value chain, because nobody is interested in the process until you show the outcomes. Tell me one reason why it is not getting penetrated as quickly as one would expect it. What are uh, bottlenecks you encounter in it? I would Scaling say they're probably, up what you, are, you have done. 
three primary challenges. Um, one is the workflow adoption. As I mentioned, we are a clinician to patient driven model and really build trust within that relationship. Um, and clinicians up until recently um, were not looking at these virtual care modalities um, in the same way that they look at the in-person. Um, and a big part of that is driven by the regulatory environment. I and mean, we see this in the markets that we work in, in, in the US and Europe. Um, until there's a framework from a regulatory perspective, it's very, very challenging to um, ask clinicians to ultimately um, adopt these types of technologies. And then the last and third point is around patient adoption. Um, and much of that has to do with uh, how simple it is to use. You know, Many patients don't have a smartphone, so how do you engage with them? And we have voice interactions, SMS interactions, and I have had to look at um, not building the shiny new thing, but really being able to meet patients where they are. I, I have a counter question to Dr. Ganju, who works a lot with physicians. Uh, uh, what do you think? Because I'm very impressed with this kind of model because 75% of the cost word across is a, but disease burden because of the chronic diseases like for India, diabetes and obesity are the base diseases. How do you find acceptability of Tanvi's beta health model in India by the physicians? Because basically medicine today is eminence-based medicine, but more it is in India where the doctor is the king. What I find, Dr. Bhandari, is that these there's a lot of great conversations around these topics at conferences, but the minute people go back to their practices, you know, they go back and slip into their usual way of working. And one of the problems I find is that we need to find what, what the incentives are to change behaviors the next day, right? And the incentives for the clinician is going to be very different than the incentive for the person in the organization, the CFO who's going to finance the innovation, uh, the nurse practitioner, everybody has a different incentive to change behavior. And unless and until we figure out what is, you know, for example, Tanvi's model is a fantastic model. But if you were to implement that in India, we need to figure out why should everybody in the value chain change their behavior the next day in order to, uh, in order to implement that. Uh, and that becomes a little challenging given that everybody is already, you know, working 18 hour days and they have a lot on their plate. But I think unless and until we find a way to do that, adoptability is going to be, uh, is, is always going to be a bit of a challenge. And I'm just putting it out there because we need to address it. Uh, we need to find a way to get around this, uh, but it has to be done. So one other thing in the uh, US, the, yeah, right, basically right. the insur insurance companies have, uh, really come up with this. Now they're really looking for a specific outcome. So they're incentivizing the patients, I'm sorry, the clinicians in a big way. And uh, so they're also pushing marketing to them rather than to the hospitals. And so that's really helping, especially Medicare. And uh, so something like that in India need the government program, which will really incentivize, especially because in India desperately need the remote care. So they should incentivize the clinicians based on the outcome. Yeah, Raj, you said it's absolutely right. What I feel, Dr. Ganju, with very little experience of critical care home monitoring, what Tanvi does, I think patients would love it. And what we have very little that if you are able to encapsulate and give this information to the doctors, particularly in COVID times, they themselves would say there is nothing more I'm going to do in the clinic like a patient with kidney failure and lupus, we used to give how much is the body weight, whether she has retained fluids or not, how to do, monitor the dose of furosemide. So I think I am trying to think more and more at the patient end, which Dr. Jaya talked about, that whether we can empower the patients with whatever knowledge we have, we have inherited. There's nothing you can do to educate, like very rightly said, there's no point in wasting time to change lifestyle for somebody who has lived with hypertension for 40 years. So I think these are the challenges. And I think there is one question I have in question box before I take discussion. I'll direct it to Dr. Jaya. It is from one of our international audience, James, who says that uh, uh, there is a patient, same very typical thing, patient, uh, uh, the legal liability of uh, online consultation current status. And he narrates a long story. I'll briefly tell that the patient was advised something and for X, Y, Z, the patient died after that. Now, 
is this doctor in this um, COVID environment is responsible for legally what is the status and what kind of disclaimers you take from these people? In the Indian context, that is the question, right? Yes. Yeah. So in the Indian context, the, uh, the legal framework as of today, uh, in terms of a personal data protection act does not yet uh, exist which would be equivalent to what is the GDPR in Europe. And of course, GDPR is far more comprehensive than HIPAA in the US. Uh, <clears throat> but we still have some provisions in the Information Technology Act uh, concerning uh, privacy and security of sensitive uh, data, personal data. And, uh, but when it comes to liability in the current pandemic environment, the Disaster Management Act uh, provisions come into play in the Indian context. And uh, under that, there is a massive amount of protection given, uh, even though the telemedicine practice guidelines insist that telemedicine should involve a uh, video consult once at least, before you start doing anything. But the this real challenge that I was trying to get to was... But, but do, do they, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Do they, do, do they insist on re keeping the recordings? The telemedicine practice guidelines insist only on uh, keeping uh, digital logs. But if, if the helplines are provided by uh, Aztak India Today channel, then any advice given on those, the liability is of the doctor. So that recording is kept. So everything that I say on a phone line, which is linked to that, I'm talking now in the context of Aztec India today. In, so in general, they are taking additional precautions. And then as a partner, we are taking responsibility for what we say. And in that situation, yes, we are legally bound. Uh, and therefore, I expect all hospitals that are doing telemedicine practice are legally bound, despite the Disaster Management Act, uh, to act with caution and care. Uh, okay. But, uh, um, yeah. I think I have one question. I know we are running out of time. Tanvi, back to you, because perhaps you have, you and Pratik have the largest experience in the present panel of using devices. Now, and we casually talked and you named it as one of the bottlenecks. What is the solution you propose for Indian environment? Because the whole thing begins with the, the monitoring devices. They have to be trustworthy. They have to be uh, uh, easy for patients to use and uh, technologically compromised uh, audience, what you are talking about. So, so from my perspective, um, as I think I mentioned, we have a very strong bias within our organization to cellular enabled devices relative to Bluetooth, just because of the connectivity issues. Um, but beyond that, what we are seeing are some really interesting devices that uh, plug directly into the phone that function as a phone cover. Um, there are some companies that can actually um, detect things from the phone camera. Uh, and so um, the more that we can drive, I think, either to the cellular enabled side uh, versus Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, um, as well as the more that we can drive to things that are already existing within the patient's general day-to-day -day use, uh, the better. We also allow within our platform for manual entry. So if you have a scale at home, um, you can use that and it doesn't have to be smart. And then from a data science perspective beyond that, looking at, you know, how do you actually calibrate that to the specific patient? What is concerning for me may not be concerning for you. So being able to take that data from a single source over a period of time and baseline it on a patient specific basis. So I think there's a few different things to think about, um, but it definitely is one of the central challenges. I know we are overshooting the time, but I am getting confident audience is sticking to it. In this panel, I wanted to bring a patient perspective, consumer perspective, and uh, uh, though time is less, but I would like before we have a brief discussion among the panel, uh, Joanna, can we have a sort of online? Saurabh is the sure, is there. project specialist and uh, is he there? All right. Uh, yes. Hello, panel members. And yeah. Hello, Dr. Uh, and he's executive manager of UNICEF and he has uh, 
an experience of managing his thousands of people online during this period. And I was casually talking to him. Plus, at his home, he is using the home health devices. And he had some good, bad, and not so good things to say. Briefly, Saurabh, can you tell this panel after you heard that what do you think? Are we talking in boardroom or, or are we talking the language you people would understand as consumer? Well, thank you very much, and, and, and really congrats to the eminent panel. A very rich discussion here. Uh, I'm speaking in my personal capacity uh, here right now, and, and basically it is uh, that I'm all for telemedicine. I have, uh, like a, from a consumer side of things, mm -hmm. I've seen that's the need of the hour and how it has helped uh, many of us uh, seeking uh, RT-PCR tests or uh, teleconsultations and how this has been so, so helpful. But at the same time, I see uh, enormous potential moving towards healthcare 3.0 or whatever Pratik was uh, uh, putting across uh, in terms of prevention, in terms of predictive support and health. Uh, uh, Dr. Bhandari, I would say one of the challenges I faced in remote monitoring concept was the compatibility, user-friendly, nature of the devices. Uh, they don't sometimes speak to each other. If you are an Apple-friendly person, uh, then it means a Google uh, uh, Android device or whatever. So, so basically, the challenge of having the various uh, measuring devices speak to each other, uh, user friendliness of them, uh, able to transmit that information, the data, uh, more easily and securely. Data security is, a, is an important point there. Uh, and, and at the same time, I, I think that we would uh, really, as patients, uh, probably, uh, you know, as from doctor's side, uh, the infographics, uh, uh, ability to play these graphics of data sets and see how the trends look, are we in the right way, uh, what are the uh, things to be uh, more careful about during those trends if there are some red alerts of flags there. So some of those things, if introduced, uh, would be extremely helpful uh, in, in, in uh, you know, both having the buy-in at the same time, uh, also to better understand uh, the progress and, and, and the limitations. Uh, so these are some of the thoughts I would put across at this Thank point. Thank you, uh, Saurabh, for that short notice coming. Kamal Kothari is, uh, Pratik, one of the earliest batches of IIMA, brightest person I know. I have not met him for a few years. He was in Shipping Corporation of India, started with industrial credit, and he has written a book, which is a very bright book. And I, I would like Kamal to say something uh, he has been raising. And thank you, Kamal, for attending this webinar. And we really want to construct some model which takes into account intelligent uh, audience for which this all Edo is about. Well, uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, basically, I'm not a doctor. It's very well known. But from a management perspective, I think all the ideas which have been talked about today are excellent ideas. The problem really lies in implementation and implementation in India. If we can implement these ideas, I think the medical capacity of the country would go up by 10%, 20%, 50%. I don't know today a priori, but it would certainly increase. Now, the basic problem is twofold. First is that the new doctors who are coming out, they have to be educated into the concept of telemedicine and how they should use it. That is my first point. And second, the existing doctors also need to be educated how they can be much more efficient by using telemedicine. So these are the two things which have to be done. And I think we will have to involve the government because without their involvement, I don't think any of these things can happen. This is the only of the reason. Thank you. And I think I will, to be kinder to the audience, I will come to end and I will request panelists to make last uh, one uh, brief uh, comment and beginning with Tanvi. Uh, if you want to have a last message, we'll go over to the panelists and conclude the panel because we have overshot the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Benthari, and, and to everybody else here, it was um, 
a, a very good education for me. Um, I think the industry is both ripe with opportunity and challenge, and it's it's all going to come down to um, creative problem solving, but keeping the patient uh, really at the center. So thank you and um, all the best. Uh, Pratik, you have something to say finally before we close the panel? Uh, sure, Dr. Bandari, thank you. And, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely, it was a great discussion. A uh, lot of insights from, from various quarters. So I think that's fantastic. And uh, I echo the thoughts of uh, Mr. Kotari that uh, one of the things which is critical in Indian perspective is the implementation part of it. And I think uh, today we have enough tools in hand to keep it really simple and develop a model, a centralized model, which can really uh, give a good start, uh, you know, and, and India is a country where we have all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, population sets available to do and run those pilots. So I think that could be a starting point. Uh, and I think there is no dearth of uh, technologies and devices that are in hand to really make it a successful implementation. So thank you so much for your time. Today. Dr. Ganju. Yeah, again, thanks very much for having me as part of this discussion. I think a lot of the solutions and technologies that we talked about uh, have been around for a while. So uh, they have been implemented very successfully in many other sectors. But I think uh, COVID is probably going to provide us a perfect storm to create the conditions for us to accelerate a lot of transformation, both within India and globally. So I'm I'm an optimist. I, I'm hoping that this uh, the challenges that we face currently will compel us to make the shifts necessary towards a more patient-centered uh, healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare environment. Finally, Dr. Jaya, before I conclude. <clears throat> the uh, key point that I want to make is that the ecosystem perspective that we talk of requires the role not just of the central and state governments, not just of the medical profession and the hospitals or the pharmaceutical industry or the medical equipment industry, but the NGOs all the way down uh, to the lowest level, the framework of the uh, governmental setup uh, and the panchayati setup up to the panchayat level in the village, you need this holistic approach where you focus not just on health, but education, nutrition and public health. So looking at healthcare without integrating AI-driven public health, epidemiology driven by public health, uh, again makes it a silo. We call it an ecosystem, but it's still not a holistic ecosystem. We are still in a health silo, uh, at best a preventive health silo. And that is no longer sufficient. Whether you look at uh, the illustrative cases I mentioned, you need to provide everything in a targeted manner. And it is possible with the simplest of devices, which is a 2G phone. So we are not talking of high technology. High technology and whatever is being done is absolutely essential. We need innovation and creativity at all levels. And that is possible uh, even with all the constraints that we have today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaya. Raj, if still you are there, we would like to hear from you how your perspective changes after this brilliant discussion. I think it's, um, I truly believe in it. I think the key here is the uh, patient engagement. If patient engagement comes, everything will work. And the second piece is the clinicians. So they have to feel they're not only responsible, but they're responsible in making sure the outcomes are effective. And so incentivizing them on that basis, these are the two are very important models. And the third is the care coordinators. I feel this is uh, like, as uh, Akar said, I'm very optimistic this will really take off. And uh, there will be a lot of the shortage of the care coordinators in the world. And uh, India can take advantage of it because I come from technology world. When I started the technology was nothing, but today look what India has taken advantage of that so much. And India has a great opportunity to create these care coordinators in a bigger way, not only for India, but around the world. And the government can institute the education, you know, creating, recreating the world standard care coordination aspects of it is a huge opportunity for the country um, beyond the, just the IT. Again, thanks for all the panelists and everybody participated. And it's a great uh, discussion. So I uh, hope uh, uh, where Foundation, uh, Dr. Bernard is working, see how we can actually, as a catalyst, create this program 
which will really bring the change in India related to this. So we look forward to working with the people who can really coordinate with us. And uh, so I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And I think uh, more than this, uh, I have recorded more what panelists did not say. My focus as a uh, uh, management uh, person is to make sure to take care of why it did not work in different areas. And definitely it gives a lot of insight. I once again thank, I couldn't have asked for a better panel for this discussion. Thank you very much for sparing your Saturday with us. and foundation is much more wiser than what it was before the panel. Thank you very much once again and wishing you all those friends in India a safe for time and a rapid uh, thing end to the COVID waves. <laughs>